Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome to another exciting talk with Dr. Ronald Brown. Our topic for today is Peter Stuyvesant, the first great New Yorker who everybody remembers from the colonial period, one of the few who we remember. And not just the colonial period in general, but the Dutch colonial period. First, we'll talk about the rise of the Dutch Empire. We don't think of the Dutch as having a great world empire. We think of the French and the English world empires, the Spanish empire, but the Dutch were in there for a period in the mid 1600s. Who was Pete Stuyvesant? Fascinating personality. When he took over New Amsterdam and New Holland, he realized that if you don't populate your colony, the English or the Spanish or the French will gobble it up. Very powerful influence in his politics. The fall of Governor Stuyvesant, the English eventually did take over, but he's not dead, really. Many people say he is still alive in the city. Well, I became fascinated with Peter Stuyvesant when I wrote my book, How New York Became the Empire City, because it was really Peter Stuyvesant that made New Amsterdam, which was inherited by New York, into a city that was more than just a small town. It was not just a colonial trading post but it had aspirations to greatness and glory. So let's begin. The Dutch, as you can see from the map on the right, inhabit a little country called Holland. And Holland, unfortunately, has always been squeezed between big, powerful Germany to the west and big, powerful France to the east, and big, powerful England to the north. So how it managed to survive is in itself an entire other topic that could be investigated. Well, the Dutch were either dominated from the, by the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation on the west or on the east, and by powerful France and England on the other side. They were constantly invading Holland. In fact, Holland was part of the Holy Roman Empire for hundreds of years. Then it was occupied by the Spanish under the Habsburgs, invaded by the English and by the French repeatedly. Well, gradually, Holland emerged as an independent country during the 80 Years' War, 1568 to 1648 fighting against the Holy Roman Empire, fighting against France, fighting against the Spanish Habsburg. Gradually, Holland became independent, recognized as an independent country with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. It was independent from Spain under the Habsburgs, independent of the Holy Roman Empire. It was finally an independent country. But throughout these 80 years of warfare, the Dutch managed to achieve a certain degree of autonomy, gradually getting more and more power and independence. Well, Holland, as you can see from the map, is a little tiny country on the North Sea. It has shipping harbors, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, the two most famous. and. As a small country, it was very interested in business and trade. So, gradually, it started looking outward, establishing business relations with England, with Russia, with Sweden, with France, with Spain, and eventually looking even further afield to North America. After Christopher Columbus discovered it, well, the Dutch were ready to start building their colony. And in fact, the North American colony was one of the biggest. You can see from the map in the middle, 
the yellow area was claimed by Holland, which includes Connecticut, half of Massachusetts, Vermont, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and the green area, the south, that was Delaware, which was also claimed by Holland. Well, the English were already in Cape Cod and Boston and were gradually taking over parts of Long Island, but the Dutch had their colony. They took over islands in the Caribbean, the north coast of South America. They took over a huge chunk of Brazil at one time. They had colonies along the coast of Africa and even Kapstadt, South Africa. They took over eventually Indonesia. They had colonies in China, in Japan, all over India, in the Middle East. So the Dutch, beginning in the early 1600s, were building an empire. Here we see the new North American empire at its maximum, the whole way up to Lake Ontario, <clears throat> bordering on the French colony of Quebec, building forts everywhere. Buffalo, New York was a Dutch colony. Philadelphia was a Dutch colony, building um, as towns and colonies all over. The capital was New Amsterdam, established in 1624, incorporated in 1625. You can see the wall going up and down. That's today Wall Street. You see the big street going to the right and left. That was the Heerweg, or the Broadway of today. And at the bottom on the left, uh, you see the Fort Amsterdam on the harbor to protect the city from any invader. The Dutch grabbed a big chunk of Brazil and turned it into a colony, gradually expanding their foothold on Cape of Good Hope, Kapstadt, gradually expanding inland. They grabbed a colony in South America today, which is Suriname, which remained a Dutch colony until 1954. They expanded in Sri Lanka, in what is today Indonesia, up into China, the island of Taiwan. They had trading colonies all over India. They even explored and claimed what is today Australia, which they called New Holland. So the Dutch were very aggressive colonizers. Now remember, this is the first wave of European colonization, Spain, Portugal, and Holland. Later on, England would get itself organized and start building colonies. France would start building colonies. But Holland was one of the pioneers, grabbing while the grabbing was good. Here we see a representation of the Dutch Empire at its high point, 1653. Still not an independent country completely, but building its world empire. And we can see how much of North America the Dutch actually claimed the whole northern coast of South America, islands in the Caribbean, colonies all over Africa, southern India, areas of Indonesia and Malaysia, New Holland, today Australia, the North Island of New Zealand. So the Dutch were very aggressive in building their colony. Well, they were a trading people, shipping people. So you can see from the trade routes, many routes going from Europe and Africa to North America, other routes going around South Africa and up to Asia. Now, this was partial government controlled, but even more so, it was business controlled. You had the Dutch West India Company, which was everything in the Americas, and the Dutch East India Company, everything in Asia, 
So if your father died and left you a couple million dollars, you would invest it in one of these companies. So you would be partial ownership of a ship that was going to Indonesia to bring back silk and spices. Well, if the ship sank, you lost the money you had invested in that ship, but so did everybody else in the company. And a couple of ships made it back filled with treasures. Well, you participated in the profit, sort of like the same organization as a corporation that we have today. Slavery was one of the biggest businesses of the time. Christopher Columbus discovered America. The Indians didn't make good slaves, plus they would run off into the interior. So the Dutch joined in the slave trade. The Dutch had inherited large numbers of Jews who had escaped from Spain when the Catholics took over. Ferdinand and Isabel imposed Catholicism as the main religion of Spain. So the Muslims were Jews and the Protestants had to get out. Many of the Jews, called Sephardic Jews, settled in Holland. Well, they had been deeply involved in the slave trade when Spain was controlled by the Muslims, because Spain and Portugal are on the Atlantic, and ships were going down along the coast of Africa, buying slaves from the local kings, and then selling them across the Arab world. So they took their trade with them when they fled Spain and went to Holland. They knew the African kings. They knew how to do business. They had access to ships. And so many of the Jews pioneered the slave trade in the Atlantic. This is still a very controversial topic uh, that people don't like to talk about, but it is part of the success of Holland in the field of the slave trade. Well, gradually, England started emerging from its civil wars of religion and got organized. And beginning in the mid-1600s, uh, it started engaging in a series of wars called the Anglo-Dutch Wars, which gradually grabbed large chunks of the Dutch overseas empire. Along with England, France started emerging, taking over islands in the Caribbean, expanding its colony in North America from Quebec down to New Orleans, expanding in Asia, eventually taking over Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and uh, islands in the Pacific. So Holland started its period of slow decline. Well, Peter Stuyvesant was appointed governor of New Amsterdam during the golden age of the Dutch Empire. He was born in Holland in 1610, died in 1672. His father was a Calvinist Dutch Reformed minister. My grandmother was not Dutch Reformed. She was German Reformed, which means no alcohol, no smoking, no dancing, no jewelry. Very, very strict Protestants. And he was of the same ilk. Well, he was a very efficient commander. In fact, he lost one of his legs in a battle to take over one of the islands of St. Martin from the Portuguese. He was appointed governor or director of not only New Amsterdam and everything in North America, but the islands that Holland controlled in the Caribbean. And he was governor um, uh, for a good number of years and a very successful governor. His mansion was called Whitehall, and uh, it was, uh, it's no longer there, but it was uh, at Lower Manhattan, not far from the Dutch City Hall, which we see in the picture. Today, Whitehall is a memory uh, in a street 
and a subway name. But he was intent on making New Amsterdam a world capital. He finished building St. Nicholas Church inside the fort. There again, very strict Dutch Protestants. In fact, so strict that they banned the celebration of Christmas because there's nothing in the Bible stating that Jesus was born on December 25th. So the Dutch celebrated the festival of St. Nicholas, who was a real person, and that celebrated on December 6th. There you see the picture of St. Nicholas of Mira. Mira was a Greek town, which is today in Turkey in the fourth century. And he was famous for giving gifts to children on December 6th and for giving dowries to young girls to enable them to get married. And so he was much beloved and much celebrated by the Dutch. Well, St. Nicholas Dutch Church, of course, is no longer there. The fort is no longer there. But the successor to St. Nicholas Church is the Marble Collegiate Church, which you see on the left, which is on Fifth Avenue. There are various churches who issued from St. Nicholas. On the right, you see one of the Dutch Reformed churches in Upper Manhattan on the west side. And you see the typical Dutch architecture with the steps going up the front. That is typically Dutch. Peter Stuyvesant also built the Palisades, which we call Wall today. It's Wall Street to protect the hall of the Dutch because they were afraid the English might invade or the French will come down from Quebec or the Indians or wild animals will break into the little colony. And so he built the Palisades. They had gates and had soldiers walking back and forth. Of course, that's no longer there, but we do have Wall Street. He built the city hall. He finished Fort Amsterdam. And as you can see from the picture on the left, the city was growing in prosperity, growing in population. The fort had a stone wall, not just a wooden wall, and it was protecting the Hall Colony from any attack by sea. Peter Stuyvesant also brought over the first delivery of slaves in 1626. 11 African slaves were brought over. They were owned by the Dutch West India Company. They were the ones who built the wall, who finished the church, who built the fort. Under the Dutch, though, they were not actually slaves. They were indentured servants, and they were given their freedom after seven years of work. It was only later under the English that slavery became the norm for the city. Now, eventually, other well-to-do Dutch people were allowed to buy slaves. And here you see the very first slave auction, a representation of it, in 1655, where other individuals were allowed to engage in the slave trade. This is a picture of the New York slave market at the foot of Wall Street as it looked under the English period. But still, if you look at the buildings around it, they still have that Dutch step facade showing that the Dutch influence still remained. The New York Historical Society did a wonderful exhibit a number of years ago on slavery in New York topic that we don't know too much about, and most New Yorkers were not eager to talk about it. But I was a docent at the New York Historical Society giving tours of this wonderful research and um, exhibit that they had mounted. Now, the problem of the Dutch was uh, Holland is a small country. It doesn't have excess population. And so 
few Dutch really wanted to go over and settle in these rather wild, rustic colonies. Of course, Peter Stuyvesant and a good chunk of the people of New Amsterdam were Dutch. But unlike the Quakers in Pennsylvania, and unlike the Puritans in New England, the Dutch did not say that only a particular group of immigrants was favored. In fact, in New England, the Puritans would not allow non-Puritans to settle in their colony. The Quakers were a little bit more welcoming later, but the De Dutch realized they needed people. They needed people to sell to build the cities. Don't forget Fort Casimir and Fort Nassau were in the Philadelphia area. Delaware had its town. New Jersey, upstate New York, even into the middle of what is today Connecticut was populated, beginning with a small number of people. But with the English in Massachusetts, and the English down in what eventually became Maryland, and the French up in Quebec, and the Spanish always circulating and looking for spoils somewhere. The Dutch and Peter Stuyvesant knew that if they don't populate their colony, they will lose it. So Peter Stuyvesant agreed to accept almost anybody who requested permission to settle in his colony. A group of English Baptists and Quakers who were being persecuted in England asked Peter Stuyvesant in 1645, can we settle in your colony? And Peter Stuyvesant, well, he wasn't crazy about these Baptists who only baptized adults, and these Quakers who were pacifists finally agreed, but he said, I'll give you land, but I don't want you polluting the good Dutch people of New Amsterdam. So he gave him a chunk of land in the northern shore of Long Island, which is today known as Flushing, Queens. Of course, it wasn't called Flushing. It was called Vliesingen, named after a town in Holland. And they settled there. Middle picture shows their Quaker house of worship. On the left was the house of John Bowne, one of the oldest still standing houses in the city. And on the right, you see a religious history of Flushing Queens written by me, um, visiting and discovering this great city. So, Quakers and Baptists were welcomed. In 1654, a boatload of Jews escaping the Portuguese takeover of the Dutch colony in Brazil escaped and were on their way back to Holland. Well, they stopped off in New Amsterdam and found it a rather interesting place. And so they decided to settle and got permission from Peter Stuyvesant. Well, Peter Stuyvesant didn't like Jews any more than he liked Quakers and Baptists, but he needed people, farmers to build farms, young men to serve as soldiers, women to produce even more residents. So he allowed them to stay, but unlike the Quakers and Baptists who he exiled to Long Island, he wanted to keep an eye on the Jews. And so he kept them in the city itself, but they had to live on a street called Mill Street, or most people just referred to it as Jew Street. Eventually, they became numerous enough to build their first little synagogue in Lower Manhattan. But of course, since there was already a dead body on the ship that they had, were on, as soon as they got to New York, they had to request permission to build a synagogue. And so we had the Sherid Israel Synagogue as the first Jewish institution in New York. The middle picture shows uh, 
Sheret Israel Synagogue as it looks today on 8th Avenue facing Central Park. Another person requested permission to stay and to visit, and this was Jonas Janssen Bronk. This is where we get the name the Bronx. We really don't know for sure if he was Danish, if he was German, if he was Dutch. We really don't know. The name is spelt various ways. Sometimes it's with a U or whatever. But this remains um, part of the history of the city. And here on the uh, uh, left, you see the oldest house uh, built in uh, Green County by Peter Bronk, one of the descendants of Jonas Bronk. A group of English Presbyterians, actually the Presbyterians were from Scotland, were being persecuted in England, and so they requested permission to settle in the colony. And so Peter Stuyvesant gave him an area called Elmhurst today, or Newton, Newtown in Queens. In fact, this is the descendant of the first Presbyterian church in the area. And my house is about five blocks away from this. So gradually, more and more people were being welcomed, not because Peter Stuyvesant liked them, but because he needed people. One of the earliest groups that settled were French Huguenots who were being persecuted and massacred in France. In fact, Peter Minwit, Minwit um, was the man who bought Manhattan from the Indians, allegedly, for $24 in trinkets and, uh, and iron knives and that. And the French established l'Église Française du Saint-Esprit. Uh, and we see one of the early representations of the church. Now, the Huguenots were very, very strict Christians, very much like the Dutch Reformed. In fact, Peter Stuyvesant's wife was a French Huguenot. <clears throat> well, the English were expanding. Because remember, the Quakers, they weren't allowed to dance or sing or drink or all that kind of stuff. And they didn't have big screen TVs back in the 1600s. So the only thing they could do for fun was to make babies. So gradually, the English started expanding out of their headquarters in Boston, down into Rhode Island and into Connecticut, grabbing chunks of what is today Long Island. Well, eventually, by 1650, tension between the English in New England and the Dutch became so um, acute that the Dutch and the English agreed on a border. And here we see this is pretty much the border of Connecticut and New York today. But it also gave three quarters of Long Island to the English and one, even less, maybe 20% uh, was allowed to the Dutch. Now, Vliesingen, Flushing, is almost on the border there. So it was a border settlement uh, to protect the Dutch colony from the encroaching English. And so gradually the English and the Dutch came into competition. And don't forget, the English were already down in Virginia, claiming chunks of Delaware, moving up into Maryland, and they would eventually cross over into Pennsylvania. The French were expanding in Quebec. Don't forget, they have taken over large areas of what is upstate New York where and um, Fort Duquesne in western Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. The French were encroaching. So the Dutch were really in a pretty weak position. Well, under Peter Stuyvesant, New Amsterdam became famous, in the eyes of some people, infamous for its religious diversity. 
Now, this map dates from later in the English period, but we can see that the Dutch were there, the French had their church, there was the Jewish synagogue, you see the Quaker churches, Presbyterian, but you still see, number four, the North Dutch church, um, uh, you have number 10, North Dutch Calvinist church, 11, Old Dutch church, you have a Calvinist church, 17, and you had various English groups who were being persecuted in England, such as the Presbyterians from Scotland. You had the New Brick Meeting, which was Scottish. You had a Lutheran church, a Scottish Presbyterian church, and a Baptist. These were the Amish and the Mennonites, and the Baptists were there. Moravians were Ger and Germans were coming over and Methodists. So New Amsterdam, unlike the other colonies uh, along the uh, sea coast, uh, was noted already for its religious diversity and its relative tolerance. Well, at one point in 1657, Peter Stuyvesant thought, my God, these Quakers are getting out of hand. The Baptists would come down from Flushing and walk around the streets of New York, New Amsterdam, and saying, were you baptized as a baby? And if somebody answered yes, then the Quakers would say, well, you're going to hell because we only baptized freely assenting adults. No forced conversion by taking some poor, innocent little baby to church and forcing the baby to become a Christian. That's something that Catholics and Jews did. Jews would take a little baby boy, force it to become Jewish by performing the circumcision. Whereas the Quakers said religion should not be forced upon people. It should be freely accepted. Well, when Peter Stuyvesant decided to get rid of some of the more radical Baptists and Quakers, they fought back. They wrote a remonstrance, which means a protest. In 1657, they sent it to Holland, and they said, we demand freedom of religion. And this must extend to Jews, to Turks, and Egyptians as well, not just Presbyterians and Baptists and Quakers and other people, but even Jews and Muslims. Well, back then, nobody even knew what Islam was. And there were very few Jews still in the, in the city. Um, but yet, it was a demand for religious freedom. Many people say this is the beginning of religious freedom in America. Well, eventually, the government in Holland and the Dutch West Indies Company said, hey, Peter, you know, you need people. Whether they're Jews or Muslims or Presbyterians or Baptists or any other group, uh, you need settlers or you're going to lose the colony. And so Peter had to back down. But this remonstrance is today in the archives up in Albany. Every, I think every hundred years or so, they bring it down to Flushing where it was written and they display it. Well, the Dutch and Peter Stuyvesant drew the line at Catholics. They were a permanent threat. Number one, they believe that they are the only true Christians, which did not make them loved. And they had persecuted Protestants in Spain. They had expelled the Muslims, the Jews, and the Protestants. The French Catholics had expelled the Huguenots. England had a long history of warfare between Catholics and Protestants. And in the New World, Little New Amsterdam was literally surrounded by hostile figures, not just the English Puritans in Massachusetts and the English in Virginia, but the French, look at the map on the right, controlled Quebec and all of the Mississippi Valley. And the Spanish Catholics were in Texas and Florida and California and just across in Cuba and Dominican Republic. And the Dutch were afraid 
you let one Catholic in the colony, they will invite in the French and the Spanish, and we will lose our colony. It was only after the American Revolution that the first Catholic Church was built, and in 1785, Catholicism was legalized in the colony. Even under the English, Catholics were banned. Now, we do know there were some Catholics here, but of course they had to pass. They had to go to Protestant church and pretend that they were good Protestants, but they remained crypto-Catholics. So gradually, the Dutch colony grew in strength and in power and we see from the seal of the city of New Amsterdam. This is the Dutch seal. Now, under the Dutch, there was no eagle. It was a crown of Holland. But with an Indian and a Dutch sailor on one side, the Dutch windmill in the middle, above and below are beaver. The number one export, beaver skins. And the number two export were in the barrels. Now, this is not Dutch Heineken beer. This is wheat because the farming area around New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, were very fertile. And they grow, grew a lot of wheat and corn, which would then be ground into wheat, sealed in barrels, and sold to the Dutch colonies in the Caribbean and South America in exchange for sugar. So that was really the wealth of the colony. Peter Stuyvesant became governor in 1647 and remained governor until 1664. He was convinced that New Amsterdam was more than a dumpy little town. It was the capital of the Dutch Empire in the Atlantic. Colonies in the Caribbean, colonies in South America, in Brazil, and a colony that included everything which is today Connecticut, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. And so he was convinced that New York was an empire city, capital of a Dutch empire. And that's why we have the Empire State Building. We call New York the Empire City. New York license plate, the Empire State. New York was recognized as an empire city by none other, a number of years later, George Washington, when he wrote a letter to the mayor of New York saying that your state is at present the seat of the empire. And there's a picture of George Washington taking the oath of office on Wall Street with Trinity Church in the distance. Uh, and don't forget, New York was the capital of the United States under the administration of George Washington. So it was people like Peter Stuyvesant who really gave New York its character as an empire city. Well, unfortunately for Peter Stuyvesant, with all of his work of building the wall, building the fort, expanding the colonies, waging war, bringing in immigrants, populating the colony, he ended up losing it. In 1664, the English, under their new king, Charles II, decided that they were going to take over the colony. This is called the Restoration. When the English had been locked in a revolution and warfare until 1660, when Oliver Cromwell and all of this business was over and done, and the English reestablished the monarchy with Charles II, who was King of Scotland already, came down and took the throne as king of england and he was going to make england 
great again. Here he's wearing a crown, not a baseball hat with make England great again, but you could see him wearing one. Well, his first target was to kick the Dutch out of North America. The various Anglo-Dutch wars, which ended the great Dutch empire, were marked by the takeover of the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam in 1664. Governor Richard Nichols sailed into the harbor in an English fleet, 1664, and took over. That should be 1664 to 1668. We're in AD, not in BC. Now, this was very important because you had the New Hampshire, you had Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, English colonies to the north. You had Virginia, Maryland, the Carolinas, and Georgia eventually in the south. And then you had this chunk of Dutch colonies, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware, and contested areas in between. And the English thought, well, it's time to unite the 13 colonies as we call them today. Well, it was a remarkable story because the, Dutch, the English knew that it was a rather prosperous colony and that it was a very diverse colony. And like the Dutch who needed to populate their colony or they were gonna lose it, the English said, we must do everything we can to preserve the peace. So the Articles of Surrender, Capitulation of 1664, basically represented um, this rather um, pleasant English takeover. They recognized Peter Stuyvesant was the former governor, and he would simply be replaced by a new governor, Governor Nichols. All the people and all the companies and businesses could freely enjoy all their farms and houses, but the English took over the fort. All public houses, in bars, restaurants, were allowed to continue. The, all the people there would be recognized as citizens of the new um, colony and of Holland. But number four, if anybody decides they're going to leave, well, they have a year and six weeks to wrap up their, their, their businesses, sell any slaves they had, gather their children, and then they could leave. They could go. People were allowed to come and go freely to Holland. They welcomed Dutch if they wanted to settle in the colony. Point eight. They guaranteed liberty of conscience in worship and church discipline, meaning religious diversity was recognized, which was not the case in New England. And they say copies of this treaty, of this declaration, copies were given to the Honorable Mr. Stuyvesant, the present governor signed by Richard Nichols and a lot of other people. So it was a very peaceful takeover. Well, this unification of the 13 colonies really impressed one of the first great writers in the United States, Washington Irving, a New Yorker. He wrote his famous Knickerbocker's History of New York. Now, at the time, it was not claimed by Washington Irving. It was um, said it was written by a guy named Mr. Knickerbocker. Well, this was a rather fanciful history of New Amsterdam. The title is A History of New York, but from the beginning of the world to the end of the Dutch dynasty in 1664. Well, Washington Irving argued that the Dutch loss of New York was really a major gain 
for the future United States of America. He claimed that when the 13 colonies finally were united into one big colony, they had enough population, enough wealth to eventually declare independence in 1776 and kick out the British and create a new nation called the United States. Washington Irving argued that if the Dutch had kept their colony and you had the English in New England, the Dutch in the middle, and the English to the south, uh, the United States would have never come into begin to existence. And he went further that not only the American Revolution was a result of the English takeover of New Amsterdam, but an entire age of revolutions began. American Revolution was followed by the Haitian Revolution a couple years later, the French Revolution, Latin American in, uh, Revolutions, German Revolution of 1845, Russian Revolution 1917, Chinese, Cuban Revolutions. And this was all the result of the English takeover of the Dutch colony. In fact, Russell Shorto went so far as to say that the island of Manhattan and New Amsterdam was really the center of the world, the epic story of Dutch Manhattan and the forgotten colony that shaped America. And Washington Irving went further and said it also shaped world history. Well, Peter Stuyvesant was removed from office, and he went back to Holland for several years, had a rather unfortunate trial at the West India House in Amsterdam. He was accused of treason, but in the end, the Dutch realized that they would gain nothing by forcing him to go to prison. On the right, we see another painting of Peter Stuyvesant marching out of the fort. You can see the Dutch windmill in the background and handing over the governorship to Governor Nichols. In 1667, Peter Stuyvesant returned to New York as the city had become known. Like all the Dutch in the city, he had been allowed to keep his baurai, which means his farmhouse. Map on the left shows you what was New, uh, New York at the time of the English, populated part in the point in the bottom left. And then further up in the middle, you see the Stuyvesant farm. On the right, you see how big it was. Uh, it was a very large estate with lands and forests, uh, and he built his house over uh, on in the center of it. And that's where he sent, spent his last years from 1667 to 1672. The house, as we see it here, burned in a great fire of 1778. Um, his famous pear tree, which he planted near his house, was um, severely damaged in a hurricane in 1867, and it eventually toppled over, and uh, that was gone, the last remnants of his bawarai. He did build a tiny chapel beside his house, Dutch Reformed, in 1660. And that existed until 1773. He was buried in the crypt underneath the Dutch chapel, which is at um, East 10th Street, at Stuyvesant Street and 2nd Avenue. And the stone that you see is Petrus Stuyvesant, uh, um, which says in English, in this vault lies buried Petrus Stuyvesant, Captain General and Governor in Chief of Amsterdam in New Netherland, now called New York, and the Dutch West India Islands died A.D. 
1672 at the age of 80 years. Now, this is in the side of the new church, which was built to replace the Dutch chapel. That church is called St. Mark's in the Bowery, and it is an Episcopal church. On the left, you see what it must have looked like back in the early 1800s with the horses and carriages and lots of trees. In the middle, that's what it looks like today with statues of Peter Stuyvesant. Now, the entrance to the vault is, if you look at the picture on the right in the middle, it is on the right-hand side up against a wall where the vault goes down into the ground, and there the Stuyvesants have been buried since Peter Stuyvesant. Well, the last male descendant of Peter Stuyvesant died in 1954. This was Augustus Van Horn Stuyvesant, Jr. He was the last surviving direct Stuyvesant descendant. And there you see in the middle picture, they opened up the vault and they are sealing it up forever because there are no more male descendants. Well, there are female descendants. And they are now in a campaign to say, I am as much a descendant of Peter Stuyvesant as anyone else, even though I don't have the Stuyvesant name. And so they are demanding rights. And they demand that it should be reopened and female Stuyvesants should be put in there as well. On the right is one of the stained glass windows in the church with Peter Stuyvesant, and on the left is one of the statues uh, in the churchyard surrounding the church. Well, Peter Stuyvesant is gone, but he is not dead. Bed-Stuy, Bedford Stuyvesant, a big neighborhood in Brooklyn is named after him. There is Stuyvesant Street, a 10th Street, right near the church in the old Bowery. Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village, a massive post-World War II housing development. Remember, after World War II, all the soldiers came back, got married to their sweetheart, and started producing the baby boom generation. Well, these young soldiers needed apartments, and they needed them fast. So you had housing developments uh, being built all over the city. I was born in 1949. I wasn't, didn't grow up in Stuyvesant Town, but I'm one of eight. And so these post-war baby boom families needed housing. Stuyvesant High School, the best high school in New York City is named after him. Peter Stuyvesant Cigarettes, Books, Peter Stuyvesant New Amsterdam and the Origins of New York, one of the many uh, books written about him. The St. Nicholas Society, founded in 1835, again remembers the Dutch contributions. They give medals, and there you see St. Nicholas, marching down through Saint, uh, the church of St. Mark's in the Bowery. On the right, you see the old Dutch clay pipes where they smoke their tobacco. So the memory of the Dutch and of Peter Stuyvesant live on. The Society of Holland Danes, descendants of the ancient and honorable families of New Netherlands, there you see one of their gala gatherings. And on the right is their medal with the Dutch gave houses with the step roof and old Peter Stuyvesant um, with his peg leg. So Peter Stuyvesant is dead, but he is not gone. In fact, he emerges every year. Some people say it's December 25th to go around and make sure nobody in New York is celebrating that hated pagan holiday of Christmas.
People go and they see his ghost outside the church. You say, scares people who are walking on the street, books written about it, photographs taken of Peter Stuyvesant's ghost. And you hear him when he walks down the street because he has a peg leg. So you hear the squish of his boot and then the thump of his peg legs. Japanese love this story. In fact, buses will be lined up around the old Bowery with thousands of Japanese tourists with their super-powered microphones, high-powered cameras, trying to get an authentic picture of Peter Stuyvesant's ghost marching around the city to see whether uh, to see how his beloved city is faring. Well, Ron Brown Media at gmail.com. If you have any questions or anything you'd like to share with me, please feel free. That's me standing there in front of the New York Public Library, where so much of the Stuyvesant memories are stored. Well, Peter Stuyvesant is one of those great men who changed the course of history. In fact, he's often cited as a proponent of the great men theory of history. That it's not worse, it's not economics, it's not religion, but it's great men and who knows in the future, great women who determine and shape history. Think of today, Putin, powerful leader, in fact, shaping the history of the current world. Donald Trump off in the wings, waiting to reassume the presidency. Joseph Biden, another powerful person. Think of FDR, of Napoleon, of Hitler, of Charlemagne of Stalin, of Mao Zedong, the great people of history. So Peter Stuyvesant is, in many ways, one of the great people who shaped the history of New York as the Empire City and shaped the history of the United States by agreeing to the unification of the 13 colonies. And as Washington Irving argues, determine the history of the world. So on that point, I will leave you. Thank you very much for joining me today. And I hope to see you sometime in the future for another exciting lecture with Dr. Ronald J. Brown. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you in the future.